my name is Craig Ritchie and I'm Professor of Psychiatry of Ageing at the University of Edinburgh and I'm also the Director of Brain Health Scotland as well as being Chair of the Scottish Dementia Research Consortium. Uh, my background has been working both as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of neurodegenerative disease for gosh the last 20-25 years uh, and at the same time working almost you know 50-50 with my academic work which initially started with um, clinical trials, uh, but it has, I guess, maybe in some ways changed also into a more sort of public health policy, epidemiological approach to some of the issues we're facing, particularly around midlife risk of dementia. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it, the, the, yes, it is. And the why is because it's incredibly common and it's a malignant brain disease that inevitably you know, leads to uh, an earlier death. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the, the numbers of people receiving this diagnosis and the, 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 the severity of it as disease is, is, is incredible. It's, um, I think, a really exciting and optimistic time from a public health perspective because we've been given information, if you like, from high quality research that's been going on for decades about these risk factors. And I think this is something which I think we can make a, a huge difference on if we purposefully and, you know, enthusiastically go after public health policy to improve brain health. And I think there's an important, I think there's a really, it's not just semantic, but I think there's an important distinction to be made between whether you run public health policy on dementia prevention or do you run public health policy on brain health? Now, that might sound trivial, and they might say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that if you talk about dementia prevention to school children, they're not going to engage. You talk to them about brain health, as, as we're doing uh, here, then they engage, they're interested. They, want to, they, they, they think the brain's fascinating. It's amazing that there's, there's more synapses in your brain than there are stars in the universe. I mean, these are the things that the kids just love. And then if you can, if you can add on to that nutrition, don't bash it too much, you know, minimize your alcohol. If you smoke, you're going to, you know, some of those star stars in your brain are going to go out, the synapses, et cetera. And guess what? I mean, a, a colleague of mine once said, you set the tone for their life in those early years. If we talk to people about brain health and midlife, it's an optimistic, it's not beat, it's a, it's, it gives people kind of autonomy and agency over their own brain health. And it's not driven by fear about getting a horrible, nasty disease. It's driven by optimism that your brain health can be good now. And guess what? You're less likely to get dementia in the future. One of the challenges, and, it, and it, it, it's, it's whether or not there's any specific uh, elements of, of maintaining or improving brain health relative to a particular disease process, be that accumulation of alpha-synuclein or accumulation of amyloid or accumulation of Huntington protein or, you know, whatever, or, or cerebral blood flow. Um, I think at a, at a public health policy level, creating those distinctions aren't helpful. Uh, I think you, what we don't want to have is a Parkinson's disease public health campaign, an Alzheimer's disease public health campaign, a cerebrovascular disease public health campaign, an FTD public health campaign. What we want is a brain health campaign. And I think we can confidently make the assumption that some of them share risk factors. Now, where there are specific risk factors, this is where at an individual level, through things like brain health clinics, we'll be able to identify some of those different disease processes over time at a very early stage and signpost people to the right intervention or the right level of expertise. So that if, if in, a, in a brain health service, for instance, you know, very specifically, we're looking at blood tests or CSF tests, and we, we will also check for alpha-synuclein levels, then of course that means that person would go maybe in a different route in terms of management, be of risk factors or, or, or pharmacological intervention. The same is true of, of cerebrovascular disease. We know that there's a fantastic stroke services all up and down you know, the, the, the UK, but they tend to be uh, geared towards people who've had a stroke. Um, and I think this is where, again, there's maybe some, you know, distinctions that can be drawn that if we're identifying early, early you know a small vessel disease in these assessments we're doing in brain health clinics then signposts people to the stroke physicians who can do some prophylactic work so i think um there's there's 
there's a there's a general approach to brain health which i think we should be 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 throwing all of our weight behind and then within that you'll see benefit in in, in these more kind of medical disease categories Thank you.